It's the season outlook for the Washington Capitals and Columbus Blue Jackets on this special crossover edition of Locked On Capitals. Your Locked On Capitals, your daily podcast on the Washington Capitals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, hello and welcome into this edition of Locked On Capitals. I'm so glad you decided to join me today. As always, this podcast is free and available on all the major platforms, including the SiriusXM app and on YouTube. And I want to thank you for making this your first listen each and every day. My name is Dan Holmey. You can find me on Twitter. It's at DanCaps218. You can find the show on Twitter. It's at LockedOnCaps. And the best way that you can help grow the show is to subscribe to Locked On Capitals on YouTube and comment anything down below. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. So Dan Holmey is our guest from Locked On Capitals. We are doing our Metro Division crossover episode here and this episode is obviously focused on the capitals a uh sneaky rivalry i think maybe maybe not the, from the capitals perspective but certainly from the blue jackets perspective dan blue jackets fans have always looked at at the capitals as an organization that we strive to be you know one day we want to be the team going on and win, winning the stanley cup it's been six years since the capitals have last won the stanley cup And um, we all know part of that cup run, the Blue Jackets actually went head-to-head with the Capitals. Blue Jackets were even up 2-0 in that series. And I I was just talking about that on an episode of ours recently here on Locked on Blue Jackets. So real quickly, Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you for uh, joining us here. This is the first time I've gotten a chance to talk to you. But is there anything you remember from that uh, series the Blue Jackets and Capitals went up against each other in? And uh, just what did you take from that uh, Stanley Cup run in general? That was an interesting series for me because, you know, even the talking heads and even the podcasters in the D.C. market said they're out of it. The Blue Jackets are going to run away with this and the Capitals will be eliminated. But it was a Cinderella story for the Capitals as they went through that through every stop in the playoffs. They went through the same thing with Tampa. And I'm like, well, they made it through Tampa and now they're going to go on to the Vegas Golden Knights. And I said, well, now they're here. You know, at the time, the Golden Knights were on fire. And I said, there's no way they're going to beat the Golden Knights. You know, they had never won a Stanley Cup. So I thought, you know, somewhere that things are going to have to fall off the rails a little bit. But as it turns out, uh, they did take down the Blue Jackets. They took down the Lightning. And then, of course, they took down the Golden Knights to win the Stanley Cup in 2018. Uh, Against all odds, I guess I got to say. But it was a magical season. Uh, We're looking to get back into the hunt for uh, the Stanley Cup this next season. Yeah, I actually want to get I want to get into that because you know, the Capitals have been such a good organization since the, in the last 20 years, really, they've been so dominant. In fact, they've only missed the playoffs six times um, in a year that starts with 2000. So that's pretty good out of of the Capitals. But what are you expecting from Washington this year? A lot of teams coming back that are going to be good. The Devils coming back, the Penguins reloaded. Uh, The Rangers had a huge overhaul, but how do you think the Capitals are going to fit in in that mix. So I've been asked that quite a bit and I am a fan and I I do this podcast, of course. So of course I should say, I see them winning the Stanley cup. However, just based on the movement, Max patch ready edition, Joel Edmondson, meh. And you know, meh moves are not going to get you a Stanley cup. I was looking for something huge during free agency. I was hoping for to bring it. I was hoping for something like that, but as it turns out, the Capitals were up against it as far as the salary cap is concerned. So they got Max Patch ready, a $2 million deal, 2 million more with incentives, a guy that has scored 30 goals six times in his career. Of course, the last two seasons, he's been plagued with an Achilles issue. That is ultimately why the Capitals got him at $2 million. Um, So I think that if they can get that kind of production out of him, at least close to that, I think that would be great. 
Uh, Joel Edmondson, a rugged defenseman. Uh, you know, the Habs are retaining 50% of his salary. So, of course, I like that. Tom Wilson got his new seven-year deal. So all the pieces in play, let's say Nick Backstrom plays the full season, Tom Wilson and John Carlson, three huge pieces that were missing from the Capitals lineup last year. Still, with all of that, I see a wild card team at best. Um, now, there is a little bit of time between now and the start of the season. It starts, uh, training camp starts already just next month. So unless they make a really big acquisition, that's where I see them. And I guess there are certain things that could change my mind. There could be someone down in Hershey, their AHL affiliate, that could just, you know, really take everyone by storm. I don't really see that being the case. And they have made, you know, they hired Spencer Carberry, a new head coach. So sometimes you can, you know, kind of get your team going that way as well. Different looks, that kind of thing. So, but ultimately that's where I land on it right now. Knee jerk reaction, wild card team at best. And that, that's where we're at. It's funny that you brought up uh, Spencer Carberry there, and I had a question on him because the Blue Jackets and the Capitals this past offseason went through the same cycle of kind of scanning the candidates out there to become the next NHL head coach for their organization. The Blue Jackets got Mike Babcock, kind of controversial in its own way. The Capitals went off the radar a little bit in getting Spencer Carberry. What can you tell Blue Jackets fans about this guy? Um, you've had him now for a month or two. What is your read on him so far? So my initial reaction is this guy is going to bring intensity. When I do my show, I have to look for thumbnails for YouTube. And every picture I find of him, there's veins sticking out of his neck, out of his forehead, his jaws clenched. He's going to bring intensity. That much I know. Um, so the one thing I know about him for sure is that uh, he is familiar with the Capitals organization. He was the head coach of the ECHL Stingrays, the AHL Hershey Bears. Um, and then he was uh, also a coach for the Providence Bruins on every ladder step that he has climbed. He has killed it. Uh, he was running the number two power play in the entire NHL last season. And that's quite a thing in Toronto. The pressure cooker up there. If there's ever a team that's under the microscope, it is the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, so I do have in, uh, enthusiasm about him. Uh, one of the things that I know about their previous coach, Peter Laviolette, was I think there was a mandate for them to win a Stanley Cup, of course. But I think that the position has changed a little bit. I think that they want to win a Stanley Cup. But to finally bring along a lot of this youth that we've heard about on the Capitals for the longest time, see Connor McMichael, Hendricks Lop here, a lot of the cream of the crop in the AHL uh, team there. So if he can get the production out of the AHL team, finally start to integrate some of these young players uh, you are taking a look at the uh, at a team that is the second oldest team roster wise in all of the NHL. That's not something to hang your hat on. That's not something that I'm real proud of. I guess there's a lot of you know experience if you're gonna you know kind of make uh, lemonade out of those lemons there. But um, I do think that that is what he's going to do is finally be the coach to bring along some of the youth. Uh, and hopefully I'm wrong. I hope that they can win a Stanley Cup. You know there is a lot of star power there. Alex Ovechkin. You know, he can score quite a bit of goals. Tom Wilson, Nick Backstrom, uh, that kind of thing. So I am trying to be optimistic. And I think that oftentimes uh, a coaching change can be just what the doctor ordered. It wasn't just him. They also added some new assistant coaches as well. But um, it is a star-studded team. They have a reigning Stanley Cup winner in Darcy Kemper just a couple years ago, won it for the Avalanche. So on paper, this team seems like it's going to be good. If they can just stay out of the injury column, a lot like the Columbus Blue Jackets, I think that the sky is the limit. You mentioned the grade eight there, and I would be kicking myself if I had a Capitals guy on the show and didn't ask him, did you ever think we'd get to a point with Alex Ovechkin where we actually believed he could break Wayno's record? Because he's 74 goals away. Um, I've kind of forced this narrative maybe on the Capitals that, oh, you know, Alex Ovechkin chasing this record is a little bit of a distraction because sometimes that happens, you know, with great players late in their career, when they're chasing a record, sometimes it can kind of all be centered around that. Maybe that's not the case for the Capitals. It certainly isn't from the way that they've restructured everything, but just in general, how cool is it as a Capitals fan seeing your own player chase after such a, uh, a sacred record, really? 
It is it is quite an amazing thing to watch. And, you know, it's one of the things where he kind of kept chipping away at it after the years and in the process of uh, of doing so, it kind of knocked out a lot of players in the process. You see Gordie Howe, uh, Yager, Brett Hull, Marcel Dion, Phil Esposito, and you're like, well, that's pretty good. But, I mean, he's never going to get that far. And here he sits. At number two, uh, just as a guy that covers this team, it is a surreal moment uh, to be able to talk about him on a nightly basis uh, for the most part because he's always in the scoring column. And even though he is going, he's 38 uh, this coming month here, he is aging like a fine wine. Uh, 73 goals until the record, career goals 822. His projection is the 24 25 season. Uh, one of the things they say, and this was what they have said about him, is he he is the Russian machine that never breaks. So if he can stay healthy, that is of paramount importance. Of course, that's going to derail anything. But uh, generally speaking, he is a healthy guy. He spends a lot of time in the gym and training and all that kind of thing. It is exciting to be able to talk about him on a regular basis. And I do think that he ultimately will be able to catch Gretzky. Uh, and that's where they have pr him projected at the 24-25 season. He has three years left on his deal. Um, and I suppose they could always give him an extension after that. But I don't want him to just you know, pass Wayne Gretzky. I want him to, you know, get a great lead. So it's going to be very difficult for the next guy, Connor McDavid, most likely, um, <laughs> that um, it, it'll be that much harder or Austin Matthews, I guess. But, you know, I want him to just make it that it's going to be very difficult for the next guy. Yeah, I mean, he's been a very fun player to watch. I, I, I think I'm biased saying that I prefer – his highlight tape over Wayne Gretzky's because that's crazy. I know it's like not even the same era comparable, but I grew up watching Wayne Gretzky. He terrorized the Blue Jackets, or I, excuse me, I grew up watching Alex Ovechkin. He terrorized the Blue Jackets for years. So he's an easy guy to root for, for me at this point in his career. All right. Uh, up next, we are going to flip sides of this locked on crossover. And uh, Dan's going to have some questions for me regarding the Blue Jackets, it'll be interesting to put these teams side by side in that way. So, yeah, we'll have that for you guys in just a moment. Get ready for the NFL season with an incredible offer from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets. That's just awesome. $200 in bonus bets guaranteed, plus all customers who bet $5 will also get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel, the app that's easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. All right, welcome back into this special crossover edition of Locked On Blue Jackets and Locked On Capitals. Make sure and subscribe to Locked On Blue Jackets and Locked On Capitals wherever you find your podcasts and on YouTube. We have a lot of great guests lined up and training camp is just around the corner. So make sure and subscribe to Locked On Blue Jackets or Locked On Capitals today. In this next segment here, we are going to talk about the Columbus Blue Jackets, another team that didn't really have the season that they were looking for. They finished last in the Metro, um, but it is not all bad news. They ended up getting Adam Fantilli in the draft. And, you know, a lot of people thought, you know, there was Leo Carlson, all that kind of thing. So for you, what was your initial reaction to the Columbus Blue Jackets selecting Fantilli? Well, first of all, it was really surprising. I, even though there were rumors late leading up to the draft that the Ducks and Pat Verbeek were really, really interested in Leo Carlson, I thought that was just typical pre draft talk, maybe just hyping it up. I was like, there's no way that Adam Fantilli is not the second best player in this draft. Clearly, the Ducks saw it differently. And hey, all power to him. The Ducks felt like Leo Carlson was a good matchup for that locker room. They're trying to go for the Ryan Getzlov style. That's obviously a, a model of a player that's worked for them well in the past. So, again, I think they got the guy that they wanted. The Blue Jackets wanted Adam Fantilli. It's an easy fit for him, obviously, for the Michigan connection and all the Michigan alumni in the room. And he's just that two-way center that the Blue Jackets really haven't had since Pierre-Luc Dubois. And even going back to that 2016 draft when they got Pierre-Luc Dubois, you can argue that 
he didn't really turn out to be the player that maybe the Blue Jackets thought he was going to be, um, at least not for them. He's been all right in Winnipeg and, and even trending upwards, but for the most part, the Blue Jackets are really, really excited about this player. He seems to hit all the things that fans want to hear in his interviews, talking about certain players that he looks up to and Matthew Kachuk, uh, Matthew Kachuk, Patrice Bergeron, who just retired with a heck of a career. So everything from the film to what he says in the media to what players who the Blue Jackets have already drafted have said about him, I am really, really excited about Adam Fantilli. Um, I hope it works out for the Ducks. I hope it obviously works out for the Blackhawks. But uh, I really do think it's going to work out very well for the Blue Jackets and Adam Fantilli. Yeah, I mean, the thing of it is, and I spoke about this with Jay kind of just messaging him a couple different times about the Blue Jackets, is you take a look at him and they really weren't um, as bad of a team, I think, as everyone kind of perceived them to be. Injury played a huge impact on that team because on paper, I thought they were going to be a lot better than they uh, you know, should have been. But then taking a look at Fantilli, one of the things I like about him is Fantilli should have an immediate impact on the Blue Jackets and will eventually turn into a high-end first-line center. Uh, that is an assessment there. Do you think he is going to make an immediate impact on the Blue Jackets, or is it kind of a work in progress? That's a really good question. I think... It, it's it's tough because, yeah, you just don't know until he's out there and the bullets are firing. I think he will make an impact just because there's so much offensive talent around him. The Blue Jackets really haven't been short on explosiveness in their front six. So he has really useful tools in Johnny Gaudreau, Patrick Laine, Kent Johnson, um, and even younger guys like Alexander Texier is a guy who's coming back over from Europe who – the Blue Jackets are really excited about Kirill Marchenko, a, a guy, a rookie last year who had over 20 goals in a surprise season. So he he will have a lot of um, assets around him to uh, make do. It's just a matter of, is he going to be comfortable right away? And I'm almost hesitant to say so because I don't want to jinx it. But from all, all things considered, it should be a pretty smooth transition. Um, I don't, I'm not in the camp that he's going to come out and have an hundred point season uh, maybe within the next five years. Again, I just, I don't know. Um, but I think he could have a 50, 60 point season and make a major impact uh, on the blue jacket season this year. Yeah, I think he could. Yeah. Cause when I was watching the draft, you know, I was watching that and I saw the blue jackets got Fantilli. I was excited for your team. You know, I'm a fan of the NHL at large. Of course, the Capitals is my favorite team, but uh, taking a look at the blue jackets, I think they're in a good position uh, to do some great things. You know, uh, there's some certain things about that team that I never thought were going to happen. Like Johnny Goodrow, you know, going from the flames to the blue jackets, everyone had him pegged going to the devils or the Rangers, the Islanders, because that's where his wife's family's from or something. So it was still kind of an odd thing. I'm like, hmm, the Columbus Blue Jackets, not exactly right next door to <laughs> New Jersey, but whatever, when you got that kind of money, you can fly wherever you want. So the other big move in the off season was the change at the head coach position and a name that should be familiar to everyone around the NHL. If you followed the NHL for a while is Mike Babcock, a guy that has a lot of controversy surrounding him. Uh, he has a tendency to kind of maybe wear out his welcome in the locker room. But, you know, I was listening uh, to him on NHL Network Radio when he was being introduced to the media in Columbus there. And, you know, it was my assessment that he had a bit of a change of heart. You know, he took some time away from the NHL and and he had some time to reflect. And I think that ultimately, at least if you're going to listen to him, he is a changed man. But Babcock, the man, 60 years old, has compiled a 700, 418, and 183 record in 1,301 regular season games over 17 NHL seasons from 2002 to 19 with the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, Detroit, Red Wings, Maple Leafs. He ranks 12th uh, on all-time wins list and 16th in games coached. Uh, so, I mean, he has the pedigree of being a great coach. There is no doubt uh, what are your reactions to Babcock? You know, I have heard the good, I've heard the bad, and I think that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Of course, I think there might be some disgruntled fan, or excuse me, disgruntled uh, players, per, you know, perhaps uh, with the Maple Leafs organization. 
Um, but uh, it does seem like he has learned his lesson, so to speak. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the resume pops off the page. So when the Blue Jackets were going through the cycle of who they should hire, I was actually like, they should look at Mike Babcock because the resume beats the heck out of any other coaching candidate. That's just a fact. Two things can be true about Mike Babcock. One, that the situation in Toronto was was exaggerated because it's Toronto, because it's a player like Mitch Marner, a huge star in the league. And the other thing that could be true is that Mike Babcock isn't so good at handling um, the player-coach relationship. He's not the best at it. You can be a good hockey coach and maybe fumble in that aspect uh, and, and in that part of the game. And I think he did. And I think you're absolutely right. In the media so far, he's admitted, Dan, that growing up uh, as, a, as a person and uh, raising three kids who are now in the 20 to 30 age range, people that are the same age as the players he's going to be coaching, he's learned a lot about how you deal with people in that generation and maybe how you can walk away from a situation with a player. And that coach may think that things are left on good terms, but really that player has a whole different thing going on in his head. So he's learned a lot about how to gently maybe more treat certain relationships. And um, that's not a thing that I was really even worried about with him because he has been a coach for so long. He has coached so many players. It's not necessarily like the most shocking thing that a couple of players had beef with a coach. That that kind of happens all over sports. Um, again, Blue Jackets fans had all the reason to be concerned because they have so much young talent in the room that you don't want it to be in the wrong hands. So understand why Blue Jackets fans were very, very hesitant on this hire. And I understand why they still are because, hey, no games have been played. But for my money, Dan, Mike Babcock being hired as the head coach was by far the biggest acquisition the Blue Jackets made this offseason. We'll see what Adam Fantilli's career looks like, though. <laughs> All right. One question before we wrap up the segment here is the goaltending department. So let's take a look at Merz Leakins and you have Tarasov. And one of the things that I was reading about it is, is Tarasov going to be the backup or do you think that he could actually battle Merce Leakins for that starting net minding job. Daniel Tarasov is the listen, the Blue Jackets, in terms of where they drafted Merce Lincolns and Tarasov, they they drafted them both in the third round. So that to them, they should be the same value goalie. In fact, Tarasov should be valued in a higher form because he's younger. He's only played two seasons in the NHL. Um, and last year, he was the better goaltender than Elvis Mers Lincoln statistically. So he's already, in my opinion, off to a better start to take the job. The problem is, is that Elvis is making a little bit more change than than uh, Tarasov. So there's an issue there. And that's just one of the things that gets tricky because you give a ton of money to a guy. So you feel like you have to play him. But that's not what the Panthers felt like a couple of years ago when they were giving tons of money to Bobrovsky, yet they rolled with Spencer Knight in the playoffs, you know? So it's one of those things where it wouldn't surprise me if Tarasov was, uh, or excuse me, if Elvis was the starter coming into the season, but uh, it also wouldn't surprise me if Tarasov took that role over because in my eyes, he is, he was the better goalie last year and he's on track to be a better goalie because he's younger. So, um, but that's only because the Blue Jackets have had just like they've had no answer at goalie the last couple seasons. So anybody could take the job. Heck, Aaron Dell could come in, make the team off the PT off the off the tryout and, and be the starting goalie for all I care. Just somebody to be league average is all I care about. So, I mean, it's a lot of questions surrounding both, both organizations. Uh, goaltending uh, is always a, a key position. So we're hoping uh, as Blue Jackets fans that you can get some consistency in that department. All right. So coming up here after the break, we will talk about our outlooks for the Blue Jackets and the Capitals. We'll talk about that straight ahead. All right, welcome back into this special crossover edition of Locked On Blue Jackets and Locked On Capitals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So let's talk about the outlook for next season. We talked about, you know, the Capitals and the moves that they made. Let's take a look at the Blue Jackets here. 
I want to hear, let's look into your crystal ball here, see if you can conjure up anything and see where do you see the Blue Jackets finishing at the end of the season? You know, with the additions of Babcock, with the additions of Fantilli and all the uh, movement that was made this off season, where do you see them finishing in the Metro? Yeah, that's that's it right there. Where where are they going to finish in the Metro? That will it's nice. It's it's kind of like a, it's nice, but it's also not nice for a team like the Blue Jackets when they play in such a tough division, because all you really have to do is focus on just playing well in that division and you'll probably end up all right. But the problem is that the division is so tough and so many teams did so much to get better. Look at what the Penguins did, like the Penguins, in my eyes, in our eyes, should have been dead and gone. Like it's time for that run for that team to just be over but they just keep coming back they just keep reloading i know the capitals were somewhat in the hunt to get eric carlson so it just has to make you sick to see him go to pittsburgh but um in my in my eyes i see the blue jackets their ceiling is maybe fourth in this division i just think uh teams like new jersey teams like the rangers carolina those three in my eyes are just kind of too good for them to really budge. And then Pittsburgh is going to be tough. Washington's going to be tough. Heck, even the Islanders, I looking at a closer look at what they did, they're still going to be all right. So it's going to be a tough division either way. I think the highest I have the Blue Jackets going is fourth. Uh, I don't think they will finish last, though. I think the lowest they will finish is seventh. I think the Flyers should be in full-blown rebuild mode this year, but we'll see about that as well. Where I don't know. Where do you have the Caps? Where do you have the Blue Jackets? So the Blue Jackets, I think, made some improvements overall. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes those things take a while to come to fruition. So it might be a bit of a work in progress. You see rebuilds going on uh, throughout all major sports. I'm a fan of the Nationals as well. And that's kind of a work in progress. So I guess it remains to be seen. That is where I would peg the Blue Jackets is kind of Sort of not a rebuild, but a retool. I guess it's kind of semantics at the end of the day. So I would say fourth sounds about good. Um, and, you know, taking a look at the Capitals, like I said before, I see it being a wild card team uh, at best. You know, there could be something that could happen that could totally change my mind. Brian McClellan could, you know, pit, bring in this big player uh, and kind of change my mind. I would love for that to happen. Do I think that's going to happen? No. Uh, the big uh, players that are kind of in flux on the Capitals are Evgeny Kuznetsov, a guy who said that he wanted out of D.C. He refuted that, but then a beat writer said, no, he actually did say that. And Anthony Mantha, who did not have the season that he was looking for. So there are a lot of question marks. Those are two pieces that could uh, potentially move out of Washington. The thing of it is, is that everyone else can see the back of their hockey card. They know they're diminished good. So it's a difficult thing for the Capitals because they have a lot of players that were good about five years ago, and those players have seen a decline. So even if they wanted to flip those players, they're not going to get nearly the kind of return that they would have if they would have parted ways with them shortly after uh, the Stanley Cup win. Um, but just taking a look at the Metro, I see Carolina winning it. I honestly do. I think that they made some big moves, uh, you know, bringing it to the Capitals here. They signed former Capital defenseman Dmitry Orloff, a big uh, defenseman that brings a, a lot to his game. I was kind of hoping that they would find a way to bring him back to D.C. As it turns out, it wasn't meant to be. But just knee-jerk reaction, that is where I see. I see Carolina, and uh, that's ultimate. I would say they're going to finish in first place. All right, that's good stuff, Dan. Um, last last one, Stanley Cup winner. Um, who do you have for that? Do you still taking Carolina? Are you still you having them coming out of the Metro and being that team, or you want to go somewhere crazy out west with this one? You know, I would say that I uh, I don't know if Carolina is good enough. That is the big thing. I think that some teams have got better. I don't think that the Penguins. I think that Carlson's a good addition. I think that having Dubis on on, de on your uh, as a GM of the team or president, whatever he is on the team, I think that that is definitely going to uh, help out the Penguins. But if I was, you know, just kind of like I say, knee jerk reaction, I would say probably the Golden Knights. Uh, I'm going to favor them as winning it. Um, you know, but a lot is to be determined. What's going to happen in training camp? We also have to take a look at the trade deadline. A lot of moving pieces, but I would say, you know, Carolina stands a chance. But I would say that if I had to pick the winner, uh, I would say the Golden Knights just right now. 
Okay, I like that. I like that. I mean, we, we already got over the fact that they won the first one. I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to keep it out west as well, and I'm going to say the Colorado Avalanche return back and win it. Uh, I just feel like they had so many injuries last year, and they only won it two years ago. So maybe they were off a little bit of a you know Stanley Cup hangover this past season. They're going to reload. They got all their guys back. Um, they're all still under the age of 30, which is, you know, that's the only time you can win a Stanley Cup is when all your uh, core is under 30, right? No, I don't know. I would know nothing about winning a Stanley Cup. My team's never done it. Uh, Dan, thank you so much uh, for coming on for this uh, Locked On crossover. Let's uh, do some more of these throughout the year. All right, man? That sounds good. All right, I want to thank you for joining me on this edition of Locked On Capitals. And are you a fan of other D.C. sports? Well, Locked On has got you covered. We have Locked On Nationals, Locked On Commanders, and Locked On Wizards. So no matter what major D.C. sport it is, Locked On has got you covered. All right, once again, I want to thank you for joining me on this edition of Locked On Capitals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Dan Holmey, and I'll talk to you again next time.